Our next speaker is Stefan Halber, Dr. Stefan Halber, uh, from InnoMedica. He's going to speak to us about clinical translation of uh, targeted liposomal doxorubicin called Talidox. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning from my side also. Um, even though it's already quite late and I guess everybody is uh, looking forward to grabbing a bite, I hope and I can uh, transfer a couple of ideas we had uh, with regard to making liposomes applied in uh, the medical applications. Um, in contrast to the previous presentation, this one is based on doxorubicin, so it's a very well-known uh, chemotherapeutic. And for us, this approach made a lot of sense, just to give you some uh, background information. As a small company, we have a very limited ways of uh, making scientific experiments, um, and we were very lucky in this case. So, because free drug is a very free drug doxorubicin is a very established treatment, and as well the liposome, the calyx, doxyl formulation is available. And these are very valuable tools for us to develop a second follow-up drug. So comparing to standards is a very efficacious way to, to actually getting some rigidity in the experimentation. And uh, yeah, so we were a little unsecure whether if we go for another molecule, if the liposomes we develop are actually of some use or not. So by this approach, yeah, we were able to compare a lot and learn. So how do you switch slides, actually? The green one. I know. Ah. OK, so I quickly just wanted to pass on a little impre a couple of impressions about uh, starting in the lab and translating it, which uh, if you st really start from scratch, it's uh, much different probably than if you had already five compounds in, your, in, in the market. Um, also, a couple of uh, background remarks about uh, how, to, how new nanodrugs are supposed to work in the body and what parameters need to be respected. I will share some in vitro data we have of uh, TLD while we compare to free drug as well as calyx as well as in vivo. And uh, to the clinical translation, I will come at the end re with regard to GMP production, GLP toxicity, and clinical phase testing. So uh, on the left, you see a very old apparatus uh, in our old manufacturing, well, in the, in the, play, in the lab where uh, we built our new lab. But before we had any money, this is basically what you confront. And it's a very old thing. And on the right side, you see the cutting edge pharma industry apparatus of today's world. And you can imagine that in between, there is quite a lot of work to move from one world actually to the other. So uh, to, to sum this up in a couple of uh, sentences, we started off as four people with very limited financial capabilities. And also, basically, our perspective was quite short term because we were not really funded for, for longer term. So this ends up with very little control uh, in experiments as well as uh, other business operations. And uh, you have no real proper instrumentation to actually address or perform what you would like to do. Once you manage to move a little further with this, uh, we are now 15 people. Uh, we have managed to stabilize the finances to some degree. Of course, there is always uncertainty involved and a little longer term security than we just started off. So at summing up, this means a very high level of control, best possible manufacturing machines are in place. You have a highly optimized uh, manufacturing process with very sophisticated analytics. It's not to forget, well, what, it's almost impossible to develop a drug without actually knowing what exactly you have just in your hands. So analytics and uh, design of new particles is hand in hand and uh, quite a difficult task, which other people have uh, already more experience than we do. So uh, also, of course, getting your supply chain managed to very high, uh, to, to good uh, raw materials and clean room setting ups and GMP quality system is important. So I wanted to draw your attention on, on a graphics published by XIA in 2014, um, where just I wanted to mention that the couple of key players in the human body that uh, take a lot of, uh, that that uh, contribute to the, to the 
theater in which a liposome can make a pharmaceutical action. So there's tumor, obviously, and uh, it's known that between 30 and 200 nanometers, there is uh, enhanced permeability and retention effects. There's the blood system that needs to, needs to be re respected. And uh, most importantly, liver is uh, still a, one, uh, a significant place of accumulation, even though it's usually not desired. Okay, I will hurry up. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, so the liposome needs to, needs to address all these questions, and um, there is multiple strategies how, how this can be addressed. And I just wanted to tell you that uh, TLD1 is, uh, in contrast to the Calix formulation, a little smaller and a little more, a little more poly dispersed. And it matters actually by which technique you measure the diameter. So TLD is around 60 nanometers in dynamic light scattering experiments, while uh, Calix is around 95 nanometers. Uh, if you take other instruments like uh, nanoparticle tracking or so, it's the diameter changes, but the ratio between the two is always uh, comparable. So uh, to, to start off some in vitro data, we have in 2D and 3D cell culture systems. Uh, we culture the A2780 ovarian cancer cells in 2D and in 3D, and we, we added the drug for 24 hours on the top of these uh, microcultures, and it was really interesting to see how the three drugs actually compare. So in a 2D system, uh, there is a huge gap between uh, the free drug as well, uh, compared to the Calix formulation, while the TLD places itself somewhere in the middle. And it was quite interesting to note that in a 3D system, Calix is a very inert interaction. It shows a very little interaction with the cell culture, while free drug is still very effective. And apparently TLD1 seems to be quite effective too, and we didn't really know why. And we added some microscopy imaging to it. And these are fluorescent images. So in the left, you see Calix. Uh, with the DAPI stain, and these are 3D tumors. So actually two things are, were quite surprising. On the one hand, we saw that these, these uh, microtumors formed in 3D gels, they, uh, they formed this sort of cellular debris around the microtumor, which has been, uh, it has been hypothesized that this is a mechanism of drug resistance, that the cells sort of built this uh, wall of, of, uh, to shield themselves off. And it's quite, inter quite interesting to note that these cells actually do that once they are cultured in 3D gels. And uh, we stained the, the DNA cell nuclei by a uh, doppy blue, so you see it in the middle, and uh, the phalloidine was for the actin stain. And there, there was a lot of background so the, between the red and the green signal, so the calyx picture shows some red, but basically it's just a crossover signal from the phalloidine no drug control looked pretty much the same, so there was almost no interaction with the 3D tumor, while Talidox was heavily interacting with the membranes showing by the yellow color, uh, which is the overlay of the green and the red, and also some violet, so blue and red in the, in the cell cores, while free drug is only located in the nuclei. And uh, we believe some differences are deviated by the, or can be derived from the nanostructure. So you see the cryo-electron micrographs of the two formulations below. This is not possible for the free drug, but you know the structure anyways. So uh, doxyl is a little bigger, and it has this coffee bean-shaped form, while uh, TLD1 is very spherical and smaller. And I wanted to go to our uh, in vivo studies with regard to this. So we implanted the exact same uh, cell line, the A2780, into nude mice. And we dosed the three drugs with exactly the same dose of uh, doxorubicin and compared the tumor efficacy. So we treated consec for three consecutive weeks. And we stopped treating for 10 days thereafter, mimicking some sort of a tumor relapse and uh, we resumed treatment thereafter. And it was interesting to note that after the relapse, free drug was not effic efficacious anymore while the nanotech was still able to do something. Um, we did the same with also triple negative breast cancer model where uh, as well free drug didn't perform that well as compared to the nanotech, which both compared very solidly and uh, 
but there was some body weight loss associated with the TLD formulation, which we haven't seen in other models. The 41 uh, model was also tried with a small size group of only five animals, but uh, we, it was interesting to note as well the free drug uh, was, comp was performing almost like a saline, while uh, the nanotech formulations did very well, while uh, one, one mouse had particularly well responded to the treatment of TLD1 and will increase. We will repeat this one with uh, bigger animal numbers, of course. So just a couple of metrics, the time to, time to doubling and quadrupling was 3.3 uh, and 12.2 days uh, for TLD1, which is uh, a gross delay of 7.2 days for the quadrupling. And interesting is also not only looking for effects, but also for side effects. So there is one really big side effect known for the calyx formulations, the hand foot syndrome. And we were looking at that in a mouse model, so we injected uh, in three mice for each group a quite high dose of doxorubicin, eight milligrams per k per week. And we realized that uh, while none of the animals treated with TLD showed any sort of reddening of the skin, uh, two of three mice showed significant reddening on the tails, which was n definitely not uh, because of the injection of the drug, but rather of the, because of the effect of the drug. As well as around the eyes, there was uh, inflammation very well visible and seemed uh, painful for the animals. Pharmacokinetics, we know a little about it and there's much more coming from the GLP talks. So there is shorter circulation half-life for TLD um, and some sort of a beneficial tumor to liver ratio we can see at 24 hours um, after injection. So uh, to summing up, there is a quite strong tumor suppression associated with the Talidox liposome. There is minimal cardiotoxicity to be expected. We didn't measure that yet, but I expect liposomes to be really solid in, the, in that way. There is barely any hand-foot syndrome. So far, we haven't any, any, uh, any reason to believe we should expect this, and also no other uh, side effects that we, we expect in that way. So efficacy testing will go on while also the GMP uh, design freeze has happened and we, want to in we, wa uh, we will produce large scale batches now and we started with GLP toxicity testing and final uh, results will be available in May, at the end of May. Also we are drafting our clinical trial protocol with the SAKK, the Swiss Collective for Clinical Cancer Research. It was very valuable for us, for our scientists, to exchange on a regular basis with oncologists to know their needs. So in a phase one study, um, which will start by the fall of this year, uh, we will do the MTD assessment, the recommended dose for the phase two, toler tolerability, efficacy, and of also pharmacokinetics. We expect for 15 to 30 patients in the trial. We will look at solid tumors advanced stages with resistance to standard therapy and of course some sort of stable health. So uh, on the course of developing Talidox, uh, we probably built like something 300 different liposome formulations and uh, actually the one or other formulation wasn't too good in uh, treating tumors, but it, we, we found uh, that there are very interesting properties in, dif in different uh, medical areas. So we now have animal data showing that uh, we can actually treat Parkin mouse models of Parkinson's with, our, with a different, very different liposome, but it's manufactured using the same equipment, as well as we can very effectively neutralize bacterial toxins and infections without the use of antibiotics. Sorry. Okay, so we are doing a capital increase until the end of May. And uh, thank you very much for everybody who contributed and helped us and you for your attention. Okay, one question. Thank you for your talk. On your cryotem, I notice, I mean, you have a circular vesicle compared to k which is oval shape. And the size of your crystals are much shorter than that. 
have you done an NTA? Because to me, you have far more particles than a doxyl or KLX preparation. So although you're giving the same doxorubicin dose, you are injecting far more particles compared to doxyl. That will change the pharmacokinetics. Yes, probably. I think that should be expected. At some level, we have more particles. We don't have the same drug to lipid ratio as, uh, as you've seen in Calix. We did that because we, wanted, we didn't want the particle to become deformed by the formation of the crystal inside. So the, our particles are actually round, where the other ones are rather stretched from the drug loading. And most likely the surface is increased, and we believe the, the available liposomal surface is increased, which we believe has a couple of actually beneficial effects. So there's more surface, it means more chance for interaction. And uh, so far, we believe that this could be an interesting area to develop drugs. Sorry, we have to move on. Thank you very Sorry. much. Thank you.